Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're taking a deep dive into a situation, well, let's be honest, it's weighing heavily on a lot of our minds. So you want to understand the Fano movement in Ethiopia. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. It's definitely complex. And to really get a grip on it, we have to start with the Fano movement's rapid rise to, well, prominence. Right, because their emergence has been, to put it mildly, remarkable. Imagine, just imagine, a grassroots movement so effective, it dismantles an entire regional government in less than a year. Mm -hmm. That's Fano, no joke. And a lot of that stems from the incredibly powerful motivator fueling their actions. It's this deep-seated belief that the Amhara people are facing, well, an ongoing genocide. Genocide, it's a heavy term. It is. And Fano claims it's a systematic attempt to erase Amhara people and their culture. We're talking violence, displacement, the whole nine yards, and it carries a lot of historical weight. And that claim, whether you agree with it or not, has resonated deeply within the Amhara community, right? Mm. It's what's fueled Fana's growth, and it's led to very concrete actions, both militarily and, of course, politically. Precisely. To gain control over 90% of the Amhara region in such a short period shows a remarkable level of organization, not to mention strategy. They've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ethiopian National Defense Force, the ENDF, and they've effectively dismantled the Amhara regional government structure. It's clear they are not a force to be reckoned with. But, and here's where the worry sets in, you start hearing these whispers of internal conflicts, factions pulling in different directions, and it's that that we're going to explore today. The infiltration of Fano specifically by certain groups within the Amhara Democratic Party, the ADP, particularly those from Gojam and Gonder. And uh, we'll try and see how Abiy Ahmed might be involved in all of this. The key thing to understand is that this isn't something that just popped up out of nowhere. There's a long and frankly disturbing history here. We need to go back to the ANDM, which was the predecessor to the ADP. For almost 30 years, they were essentially, well, puppets. First for the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, who held power for so long. And then later for the OPDO, the Oromo People's Democratic Organization. And throughout this whole time, they were complicit in the Amhara genocide. So you're saying that while the Amhara people were suffering, these people, their supposed representatives, were actually part of the system that was oppressing them. It's a hard truth to accept. But yes. We're talking about officials like Adisu Lajess, Barricade Simone. These individuals held these high positions within the ANDM and then the ADP, despite not even being Amhara themselves. Just imagine that, the sheer audacity. And their families, during this period, they amassed wealth and power, all while their own people were being targeted and suffering. It's a profound betrayal. And it was this betrayal, this utter disregard for the Amhara people yeah. that gave rise to the Fano movement, right? They had no other option but to defend themselves. Absolutely. Fano rose from the ashes of this oppression, driven by the need to protect their communities, to survive, and their effectiveness. The fact that they managed to weaken the ENDF and challenge Abiy Ahmed, well, that caught the attention of these ADP factions, especially those from Gojam and Gondor. So instead of seeing Fano's success as a win for all Amhara, these factions, mm. they saw an opportunity. Yes, exactly. They saw the power that Fano had, and yeah. they wanted to use it for their own political ambitions. They had a strategy, infiltration. They started subtly getting into Fano's ranks, offering support, you know, funding, logistics, maybe even intelligence. It was all about gaining influence, ultimately control. But why the division between Gojam and Gondor? Shouldn't they... I mean, given the crisis facing Amhara, shouldn't they be united? Well, this is where the history of Amhara comes in. The dynamics of power and resentment within the region, for example, the Gondor ADP faction, they have this deep-seated belief in their own superiority, their, their inherent right to lead. You know, it comes from their historical dominance in Amhara politics. Think of it like uh, maybe an older sibling who's always been the one in charge and just expects it to stay that way. OK, so I'm starting to see where the cracks appear. Yeah. So Gondor ADP sees Fano as their tool, something they should yeah. control because they think they're the rightful leaders of the Amhara people. That's a good way to put it. They focused on infiltrating Fano fighters within the Gondor region specifically slowly and strategically taking control, almost like, you know, a puppet master behind the scenes. But with the Gojam ADP, it's a different story altogether. So if the Gondor ADP is the older sibling calling the shots, who are the Gojam ADP in this family? They're the ones carrying all this historical resentment. They feel sidelined, looked down on by the Gondor faction. And their approach, well, it's much more aggressive. They don't want just a piece of the pie. They want the whole thing. So we have these two powerful factions within the ADP, both vying for control of Fano. And caught in the middle are these brave men and women who make up the movement, risking their lives to protect their people. 
And that's the real danger here. The fight for control, the maneuvering for power, it takes away time, energy, resources, all away from Fano's core mission, which is to protect the Amhara people. It's almost like a tragedy, isn't it? The very people meant to protect Amhara are being manipulated and divided by those who claim to represent them. And that's just the beginning. What makes this even more complicated, even more dangerous, is Abiy Ahmed's role in all of this. He's not just sitting back and watching. He's playing a part. Sinister game, classic divide and conquer. He's offering support, sometimes just tacitly, to both Gojum and Gondor ADP factions. And by doing that, he's making sure Fano stays divided and weak. Like he's holding a mirror up to these old rivalries in Amhara, making them worse, almost yeah. weaponizing them. Exactly. It's cynical, no doubt, but not surprising from him if you look at his history. A united Fano, a Fano with a clear purpose, strong leadership, that's a direct threat to Abiy Hamid's power. Keeping them divided, he controls the narrative, keeps his dominance. It's, it's chilling to think that the very people, the institutions, meant to protect Amhara, from the ADP to the Prime Minister himself, they're the ones making Amhara vulnerable. But let's focus back on Fano for a moment. If these factions are actually succeeding with this infiltration, what does that mean? What are the consequences? The consequences, they could be devastating. A divided Fano is a weak Fano, unable to protect Amhara communities, unable to really resist the violence, ultimately unable to secure a future where Amharas can live in peace with dignity. So it's not just about politics then, it's about the safety, the survival of real people, real families right now. Absolutely. There's a human cost to all of this that can't be ignored. Families who have lost loved ones, communities torn apart, the fear, the uncertainty, it's everywhere. And a fragmented Fano distracted by infighting. They can't offer the protection that's so desperately needed. And it's that vulnerability, that sense of abandonment, that's what these ADP factions and Abiy Ahmed are using, aren't they? It's a vicious cycle, a tragedy, really. The very movement meant to defend Amhara. Undermined from within, their strength diluted, their focus lost. And who benefits? Not the Amhara people, that's for sure. It's those who want to control them, manipulate them. It's hard to hear, but we need to face it. So given all of this, what can be done? How can Fano be protected from this? What can, you know, ordinary Amharas, people listening to us right now, what can they do to make sure their voices are heard, their safety is a priority? That's the question, isn't it? The answer, I think, is in recognizing the danger, understanding what's really happening, and then taking action, reclaiming the narrative of Amhara resistance. This means knowing the tactics being used by these ADP factions by Abiy Ahmed. It means questioning anyone who claims to speak for the Amhara people, demand transparency, hold them accountable. So informed action, pushing back against the manipulation, bringing Fano back to its core mission. Exactly. And it starts with awareness. The Amhara people need to see past this facade of unity from these factions, recognize the personal ambitions driving everything, and understand how that's putting their lives at risk. Seeing the strings, as you said. Yes, exactly. And once you see them, you can start cutting them. Maybe this means supporting those within Fano who are truly committed to Amhara. Maybe it means calling out those who are exploiting the movement. Maybe it means organizing, mobilizing within your communities, making your voices heard. It sounds daunting, but necessary. It is daunting, I won't lie. But the stakes, they couldn't be higher. The future of the Amhara people, their very survival, depends on it. I mean, it's a lot to take in, isn't it? This whole situation, the weight of it all, feeling like you're caught in the middle of these power struggles. It can be, well... Overwhelming. I understand that feeling. Really, I do. The situation is incredibly complex and the stakes, well, they couldn't be higher. But I think we need to remember, even now, even with all of this, there's still hope. Signs of resilience and definitely opportunities for action. You're right. We have talked about the challenges, the manipulations, that sense of being abandoned by those in power. But we've also talked about the incredible strength of the Amhara people, the bravery of Fano, the desire for a future where their voices are heard and where their rights are respected. And that's where we need to focus our attention. What can be done? What actions can be taken? Not just by Fano, but by ordinary Amharas to, you know, reclaim their agency, fight for their future. Okay, so let's shift gears a bit. Instead of just the problems, let's look at solutions. Where can the Amhara people find hope, find strength in all of this? What steps can they take to protect themselves to build a better future? It has to start with unity, like we talked about. A divided community is a vulnerable community. 
the Amhara people have to find a way to bridge the divides, to come together, you know, in support of their shared goals, their values. This means setting aside regional differences, resisting those who want to pit them against each other, and recognizing that their strength, it comes from collective action. But how do you even achieve unity when there's so much distrust, so much resentment, so much history of being let down? It's not as easy as just saying, come together. No, you're absolutely right. It's not easy at all. It's a process, and it takes conscious effort. Building trust, having open and honest conversations, listening to each other, finding that common ground. Maybe it means reaching out to those you see is different, engaging in dialogue, truly seeking understanding. Maybe it means supporting initiatives that promote unity and cooperation within the Amhara community. So it's about building bridges then, yeah. finding ways to connect with each other on a human level, mm -hmm. despite all the political and historical baggage. Exactly. It's about remembering that they are all Amharas. They share a culture, a language, a destiny, and recognizing that their strength, it comes from that unity, from standing together. And that unity, it needs to go beyond just the Amhara people themselves, right? They need allies, both within Ethiopia and internationally. People who see the injustice, who are willing to support their struggle. Absolutely, and that's where the power of storytelling comes in. The Amhara people need to tell their stories, share their experiences, make their voices heard by a wider audience. This might mean using social media, talking to journalists, human rights organizations, or supporting independent media, those who report the truth. Getting the word out, breaking through the propaganda, making sure the world knows it's happening. Exactly. And it's not just about stories of suffering. It's about highlighting the resilience, the courage, the determination of the Amhara people, showcasing their culture, their values, their commitment to a better future. So it's a multi-pronged approach then. Building unity within the Amhara community, finding allies, using the power of storytelling to make their voices heard. Exactly. It's a challenging path. There's no question about it. But it offers hope. A path towards a future where the Amhara people can live in peace, in security, with dignity. And that's really what this whole deep dive has been about, hasn't it? Trying to shed light on this complex situation, exposing the manipulations, but also offering hope, showing that even with all of this, there's a way forward. It's about empowering the Amhara people, giving them knowledge, understanding, and a belief that they can shape their own destiny. So to our Amhara listeners out there, we leave you with this. Be informed, be vigilant, be united, and never give up hope. The fight for a just and equitable future for all Amharas, it's a fight worth fighting, and it's a fight you can win. Remember, your voices matter, your stories matter, and your lives matter. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive. <laughs>